Told you. Yeah, recording started. So welcome everybody for the community call for August. Uh, so uh, the agenda today is uh, updated news, progress on conver uh, conversion, new modules, and Michael is going to talk about uh, Azure Arc, and then we can have some questions if there are any. I I think we go fairly uh, fairly fast through the first part, so Mike can start talking. Uh, it's not so much. So we update the news. We can start with the the automated documentation we uh, we have for uh, the DC resource, the DC modules. Um, we have uh, last uh, community call we talked about we, that we can publish uh, GitHub wiki documentation, and we now uh, add uh, so it is possible to add markdown in the schema as well. Uh, so we can format the GitHub wiki pages a little bit better, and that markdown is also removed when uh, the conceptual help is generated for the modules. And also, I'm, I'm working on a blog post for this uh, that's going to explain how this is the DSC resource uh, dot, dot generator module that does this, uh, and it has build talks. And I'm working on a blog post that I'm going to explain how how it works and what you can do with it. Um, it's, it's coming along, but I, I found a few bugs that we just recently merged, so that I needed to have in before I could continue. So yeah. And then the biggest news is the proposed changes to the DC resource platform uh, that uh, Steve Lee um, created an issue for. It's a link here. Uh, if uh, maybe Mike, can you post it in the chat? Maybe if you have it. Uh, so uh, it's considered for PowerShell 7.1, and we have asked uh, Steve Lee to join us in the next call in September to talk about, to discuss this, uh, these changes. Um, but the highlights are, it's, uh, it's proposing to move to JSON instead of MOF in, in, for PowerShell 7.1. Uh, uh, Windows PowerShell LCM is, will be unchanged and will only support MOF. And as a comment of on the comment I made on the issue, uh, it's it will be possible to add both MOF and JSON to a DC so it can be compatible with both uh, Windows PowerShell and PowerShell 7.1. So, but uh, let's leave it at that, and we can talk more with Steve Lee next month. Um, yes. The conversion so far, we, another one has been converted, JEA DC, and currently none is in progress. Uh, we actually, we only have, uh, I mean, we come to that. Um, so these are the still the two that have recent activity. Uh, it has been recent for several community calls now, but uh, these two are those that have, I think, a few months back, have uh, oh, activity. You can still track progress on the uh, project board, but it's all the rest are actually not. There are no activity in them, so I'm not sure if you're gonna put time time into converting them as of yet. Uh, so if anyone is using those modules or want to use them, please uh, make sure there's activity in them so we can, or, or just uh, tag us in the issue so we know you're interested in that being converted. So currently all in the to-do list here in the project board, all the to-do, these are blockers. So if, if any change are merge in these, they are not gonna be able to be released until they are converted. Uh, but uh, I don't think we have been com been in an activity for a long time in those. Yes. 
We have a new module. I think we have a new module since the last call. Uh, Daniel, do you know Config Manager CBDC? This is it's a new one, right? Yeah, it is. It is. I'm, I'm pretty sure it is. I haven't. Yeah, I haven't seen it before. So yeah. Yeah. So uh, Ryan Chrisman and Nick. I don't know. Maybe it's Nick Ellis. I don't know. Uh, that's our maintainer for that one. Um, and then we added two other, you could say, containers. Uh, these are uh, two resources that was asked in the Slack, uh, uh, in the PowerShell uh, DC channel, the Slack and Discord channel. And I, I call them WIP modules, work in progress modules, uh, because they have no DC resources yet. Uh, they're just placeholders. Uh, where we can, where the community can add uh, resources. And the maintainer is uh, Ryan Yates. So please go and create issues for Azure DevOps, oops, sorry, Azure DevOps DC and GitHub Enterprise DC. If you see that you want uh, any, any resource in that, please create issues. Uh, or talk directly to Ryan. He's on the in the Slack channel, DC channel as well. Uh, I won't list these. Uh, these are the DC series modules that has been released since last call, uh, and the new uh, the new tools we have uh, releases for them: common doc generated test, and a bunch of preview releases. That's pretty much uh, covers uh, that. Does anyone have a question so far? Let me see the chat. No questions. No one's writing either. So well, let's leave it over to, let's give it to Michael. Michael, you can cool. talk. I, uh, yeah, this sounds good. Oh, sure. Actually, let yeah. me switch to my headset and you will hear me a little bit better. Okay, can you still? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, yeah. So let's talk about first, what is Azure Arc and why should the DSC community even care that it exists and, and what's going on with that? And then uh, hopefully we'll have some quick demos and links to information because everything I'm going to talk about today, you can uh, experiment with on your own. So uh, nothing we're going to be talking about is in any sort of preview. Uh, well, it's all public preview, but nothing is in like a private state, I guess I should say. Um, so ARC, is, is ARC, by the way, is A-R-C, ARC. And it doesn't stand for anything. <laughs> uh, so we're, we're so accustomed to three letters being used as an acronym uh, in IT. But in this case, ARC, uh, you can think about it ARC as in the shape, um, sort of reaching between two points. And the thinking behind this is um, as, as people have tried to figure out what this concept of like a hybrid cloud approach would look like, uh, you know, basically, we, we've ended up across the industry with lots and lots of silos. And uh, where Azure has been in the past is a really good example of this. So uh, if you think about Azure Automation DSC, you know, if you're registering a node into that service and you're not running in Azure, then you go into the service, you get the URL for the account, you get a private key, and then you would go configure LCM on each box, and it's you know you sort of on your own to go look at the DSC docs and figure that out, and you know build the metamorph and apply it everywhere. And then you might decide that you also want to do monitoring. So very similar thing, you have to go download an agent, and then there's a URL and a key. Um, and as you start looking across all the different services, backup and others, you'll find similar experiences. They're all sort of you know, thinking about how individually from service to service, you're going to connect a machine to the cloud. Uh, and as you look across other environments, AWS, uh, Google, others, you find very similar scenarios. And one of the really common questions for System Center was always, why do we have, uh, I, I, it's why do we have so many agents? But the, the pain point wasn't totally just about, uh, 
why are there multiple agents running on the machine? It was also like, why do I have to navigate this complexity? Why do I have to be an expert about how to onboard, um, you know, SCCM and SCOM and VMM and on, on the line? So we set out to solve this problem. Uh, and where we actually ended up with is now uh, almost sort of become viral within Azure. And that's this notion of like projection. Uh, and the idea is, what if rather than having cloud services accept registrations from machines outside of the cloud? Um, because, you know, really, that doesn't really change the way that you were, um, the process that you had around managing those nodes totally. It does to some degree, but not totally, right? Um, it just changes what you were going to run to get them into the scope of management. Well, with projection, we sort of flipped this whole thing upside down. And the idea instead is to say, what if we took things that are not in the cloud and project them into the cloud, which means uh, quite literally, there's going to be a representation of that thing, even though it's just a record um, living in the cloud. And then uh, depending on the type, you connect the machine one time, like in this case to Azure, and all of the services that are available in Azure just work. So even though the machine is not an IaaS machine, like an infrastructure as a service machine hosted in a Microsoft data center, it's still running in your private data center. All of the concepts, it's, it's in a subscription, it's in a resource group. You can manage it using Azure policy. You can deploy extensions to it. You could run you know, custom script extension to reach out and run scripts or DSC extension if we want to apply a DSC config uh, or guest config extension if you want to audit it, uh, the monitoring extension if you want to do monitoring. And of course, we collect um, what operating system it's running. Uh, that's pretty much it for what we collect right now. Um, you can tag it. So if you wanted to organize your on your, the, the servers that are running in your private data center, according to resource groups and tags to keep track of who the owner is or what project it's associated with. All of those concepts that you see used in cloud scenarios would just work. Um, and you, you know you can navigate it uh, uh, through ARM and, and see it represented as software. So one of the things that's been really early customer feedback on this is uh, using this for something like CMDB. So if you're, you've, you've got a variety of servers running in your private data centers, could be, you know, around the world, could be, you know, in, in your local office. Uh, and this, by the way, when, when we talk about servers that are outside of Azure, could also be servers that are running in AWS or in Google Cloud. It doesn't really matter where they're at. It just refers to things running outside of Azure. Um, and so, you know, the idea of, if it's running on Hyper-V, VMware, if it's hosted by Rackspace, et cetera, uh, and you're hosting a CMDB to maintain the inventory of all of your information, now you're supporting the connectors for every one of those types of environments. And one of the things people discovered right away was, well, I just put the Arc agent on this and now I can just query one API and I can see all my machines everywhere. And then another point of feedback that I thought was really interesting, um, somebody made the comment, well, if we just put this agent on there and it's basically just sitting there not doing anything, just sort of checked in the machine. Um, and we now release it from operations to application owners, then if tomorrow that application team submits a request for the operations team to onboard to monitoring, you no longer have to figure out, okay, well, what platform are they on or what environment are they on? Um, what do I have to run in order to figure out, you know, how to onboard that into a monitoring solution or patch management solution or whatever? It's all just what we call control plane. It's all just Azure Resource Manager calls. So you could run a PowerShell script, tell Azure, I want to deploy the monitoring extension to these machines that are in a resource group that represents that application, and that's it. You don't have to worry about scripting across VMware versus scripting for Hyper-V or Virtual Machine Manager or um, you know, making a call over to AWS and things like that. You sort of got a common scripting model you could follow. Um, so just to visualize this, 
I'll share my screen and then I'll show a quick demo. So this kind of gives you like an architectural um, view of what you could expect, but you can think about it as a customer, uh, all, all of these tools and experiences that you might have used already for Azure just work, right? Whether you're calling from PowerShell or if you prefer AZ CLI or some other SDK, um, you know, all, all of these concepts of how that you interact with it uh, are all consistent. All of the management services that you would think about becoming available, um, including patch management service um, and others, just like the same way that they're available in Azure for machines that are running in Azure and, you know, guest configuration benefits from this scenario big time because so far guest configuration has only existed in Azure and I'll explain why that why you would care about that in a second. Um, and this this makes guest configuration accessible outside of Azure as well. Um, as far as like once the records created and who can take actions, uh, the same security model applies even though the machine is outside of Azure. Um, being able to do things like um, use blueprints to control who can take what actions across those machines or automatically take actions on the machines as they're registered all still exists. And again, we really, it, it can be in your data center. Um, it can also be just in any cloud environment outside of Azure and it works the same way. So if I bring over my browser, um, actually let's start since uh, this is a more technical audience. Um, So I started this just a few minutes ago, so hopefully everything has had time to run. Um, but this is just a machine running in VirtualBox on a MacBook. And there is a DSC resource, which I need to get handed off to the community. I was going to do that already, and I didn't get a chance this week, um, that I wrote that uh, the only chore is keeping the examples up to date because the ARC agent, since it's in public preview, has been getting frequent updates. But uh, there's a DSC agent uh, or DSC resource that handles uh, just calling the uh, the executable that gets downloaded whenever ARC is installed and handle the connection. Um, and there's a service principle you can create with a role definition. So basically, there, there's there's a um, an identity that you can register and say the only permission that this identity should have is that it can register ARC machines. And then its username is going to be a GUID and its password is a long complex auto generated password. Um, so that way you can embed that in your scripts with no risk that it could be used maliciously. Um, and the example config in that repo for the, the ARC connect or Azure connected machine DSC resource, did I get that right? Azure Connected Machine Agent DSC. <laughs> uh, so I just have the package resource go out, download it, and install it. And then I've got the service resource, make sure that the hybrid instance uh, metadata service is running. And then I use um, that resource to actually do the registration. Um, that is included in the docs. So if you go out to the ARC, Doc, uh, docs.microsoft.com, Azure, Azure-Arc, and look under servers for Arc-enabled Arc servers under how-to guides. When you click on connect to Azure Arc, uh, we made sure that connecting machines with the PowerShell DSC resource is a fully documented scenario for onboarding at scale. Um, so if I go look at what it creates, uh, this is the Azure portal and I'm logged into my account. I've got a resource group uh, where like if I was provisioning a virtual machine, you would see that get created here, but you can see machine Azure Arc. And if I go take a look at it, um, you'll see I can confirm it's connected. Uh, it, it has a location, but keep in mind, this is not the location of the machine. This is the Azure region where the record was created. And uh, obviously it's nice to have uh, you know, that location be close to your environment so that um, you can, um, sorry, I just make sure what my, my phone was going crazy. Um, it's nice to have that be close to where your servers actually are, but at the end of the day, that it's not like that traffic is doing a whole lot. So um, if it's close, great. If it's not, it's not the end of the world. If you wanted to put a machine, you know, in Colorado and have it create a record in uh, East US, I don't think you're going to see a huge traffic issue because it's not like it's sending anything more than a heartbeat. 
Um, but it's in a subscription. Uh, you can apply whatever tags you want. Um, it does pull the computer name and the fully qualified DNS name. Uh, you can keep track of what operating system and the OS version and then uh, the agent version. Uh, you can control who has access, although from this point right now, it's mostly like who could add extensions and who can see it, um, who could change its properties like adding tags. And if I go look at extensions, we'll see if looks like this hasn't had time to run yet, so that's fine. Might have to run uh, remediation task, which would be fine. Um, if I click on add, then I can run custom script extension. If I just run want to run a PowerShell script, um, I've got log analytics. So if I want to onboard to monitoring, and there's also DSC. And if I click create, uh, this works exactly the same way as if the machine was running in Azure, even though it's running in your data center. So you're just going to point to the power. So the, with DSC extension, it's going to get compiled on the machine where it runs and generate them off locally. The nice thing about that is if you want to put some additional logic in the PS1 file to have it discover something about the machine and feed that in before the moth is created, that would work. Um, so compilation is happening uh, locally for the extension. And you can pass in arguments and um, you can pass in a PSD one for the data file. Uh, you can pick which version of WMF you want because uh, if you were choosing an operating system like 2012 uh, that you might have a requirement for for an application and it doesn't have uh, Windows Management Framework 5.1 yet, then this would install it. So you have to keep an eye out for that because WMF 5.1 um, might be something you're not ready to install on your machine. So keep you know pick the, the version that you're expecting to be there. Um, you can decide whether or not to uh, collect telemetry and auto upgrade minor version just means for the DSC extension itself, not DSC, but for the extension that's managing making these calls. Uh, if we go from version 27 to version 28, should it automatically update? And in most cases, uh, everybody that I'm aware of chooses yes. So you'd fill that out, click review and create, and it would actually install the extension um, but instead of being on an Azure machine, it'll end up being uh, in the on-prem machine. Uh, update management and onboarding to that works exactly the same way. So if you're interested in patch management as a cloud service, uh, it's something that you can use as part of this. Um, and obviously inventory, change tracking, the other autom automation services uh, are something to take a look at. Monitoring and, and um, log analytics, uh, is also something that can be onboarded from here. And you can think about this in two different ways. So in this case, I'm looking at the properties of one machine. And you might come in here, especially if you're just poking around for the first time and decide, OK, I've onboarded the machine. I went through the documentation. Now I just, for this machine, want to turn on monitoring or apply a DSC configuration, et cetera. Um, and by the way, I should add a DSC to think about that. I guess it wouldn't make sense to have a DSC resource. You can't invoke the extension install from inside the machine. So the, it'd be best to have the DSC resource inside the machine just handle registration. Um, and then of course, at that once it's registered, uh, you, you know, unless you want to use partials or something, uh, if you're using DSC extension from Azure, it's going to overwrite using DSC extension to install the agent, which is fine. Um, so once that's set up, if you go into the policy blade, which you would get there, you know, if you're not familiar with Azure, um, that's just considered a service. So you could go to all services, type in the word policy. This will show up. You can click on it and get to here. Um, I've got a custom policy here that I've uh, been playing around with. Let me see if it's detected that machine yet. Not yet. Um, but basically, under definitions, if you look under category, And I have switched this to initiative. Uh, all of these policies will work both for Azure machines as well as ARC connected machines. And uh, the reason you might care about this is this is all using guest configuration, which is uh, kind of like when we started talking about the new LCM in the past. Uh, this is that code base. So this is DSC completely rewritten uh, as a cross platform C project. Um, and for Windows machines, the language abstraction for what audit to perform is DSC, but the agent is actually running PowerShell core. And um, 
all of our resources. So right now it's just performing audits. We are working and hoping by the end of this uh, calendar year to have more information about guest configuration, guest configuration also being able to apply uh, some scope of configurations. We'll probably start off with things like regulatory baselines. Um, and if you're interested, if you go out to github.com slash Azure slash Azure policy, under the uh, samples and then guest configuration and package samples. All of the DSC resources that we're using for those built in policies, uh, with the exception of the baseline, because those resources are actually written in native code, um, they're all out here open source. So, you know, the one that checks to see if it's a domain member would be a good example. Um, and this is running in PowerShell 6.2. We will update to 7, but uh, so far we've had, I mean, just as a point of reference, we've had really good success working with PowerShell 6.2 in terms of DSC resource compatibility. Uh, I would imagine there are some modules, like maybe the SQL module or something, that probably just doesn't work yet in 6. Uh, 7 should have better compatibility, so we're, we're working on getting to 7. And you can see... Um, the way that this works for the audit scenario is you know, data get set and test first it's going to run test to see if it's in the right state uh, and then it's going to run get to collect the current state for reporting purposes uh, if it ever does get to set it's just going to throw so basically the resource is protecting that machine as well um, but the big thing i wanted to share on this community call if you um, get a chance and you go into manage and use Azure VM extensions from these docs, then you can follow this uh, and use the DSC extension. And then of course, as always, as, as you've always been able to in Azure, you could use the DSC extension to onboard to Azure Automation where you would get the full pull service uh, asset management in terms of storing and compiling your configurations and modules, uh, graphical reporting about the state of the machine configuration, things like that. All of that works. Um, so you can actually use the DSC extension for ARC to onboard to Azure Automation and get those reporting benefits. And how to do that is documented on this page. And so this explains all these supported extensions, where to get the agent, how to do it from the portal, which is what we showed earlier. Uh, how to do it from an actual deployment template. Um, here's how to run custom script extension. Here we go. So here's deploying DSC extension. And I think the example, yeah, that it's given is how to um, actually pass the registration information for uh, Azure Automation at the time whenever you're running the extension. And then the last thing I'll show before I close, or at least take questions, um, back here in this GitHub repo for Azure policy under samples, I did stash in here two Azure policy samples, one for Azure automation. Um, this one does support ARC machines. The logic for that is here. You can see the resources, Microsoft.hybrid compute. And this is going to do a deploy if not exists. So really what it's saying is um, if you don't have the extension named DSC, but you're a hybrid machine, then trigger a deployment with this template. And what you should deploy is the extension. Um, and this is actually doing a lookup in real time. So it's doing a reference to automation accounts and a list keys. Uh, the benefit of that is whenever you're in the portal, you won't have to type that in. It'll just give you a drop down list of all of the available automation accounts. You can just pick the one that you want, hit assign, and it would do onboarding. And then similarly, I stuck under compute, deploy DSC extension. It should be very similar. Yep, includes everything there. Uh, the difference is, I think it probably at the bottom. Uh, it gives you a full set of parameters so that you can just tell it, 
I've got a zip file containing a configuration script. The name of the configuration script is this. The function inside the script is that. And then you could just put that in GitHub or blob storage or wherever you want to put it and uh, be able to just use DSC extension by itself without Azure automation to apply a configuration to a machine outside of Azure. So the next phase of this that'll be really you know great we'll we'll, we'll keep getting uh, as we get closer and closer to uh, moving arc out of preview um, you'll see more and more content about how to use dsc with arc both for uh, assigning the agent doing onboarding so like if you wanted to use your pull server or azure automation to onboard machines to arc uh, you definitely could um, the resource could also be used with chef puppet ansible etc as part of invoke dsc resource and then um, as we get arc to being generally available then we've got plans to uh, refocus our efforts through guest configuration on things like uh, you know, best practices and baselines for audit and then being able to apply those as well. And then we've got a, a whole set of things on the backlog that we want to get to after that. So um, pretty excited about everything that's going on here. I, I think within the next year, we should actually see quite a bit of new investment in DSC. Steve will talk about that quite a bit on the next call, so I don't want to steal too much of his thunder, but I'm um, pretty excited to see some new things coming. So I'll turn off my screen share and. Ooh. Nice. Uh, any cool. questions? How does distancing work for a machine which is onboarded as a hybrid machine into Azure Automation? Is it treated as an on-premises or, or Azure machine? It treats it as on-premises. Uh, it does have a resource ID. So one of the things we're looking at for Azure Automation is like when you click the, when you click the button in Azure Automation to say add a new machine, there's really no reason why Arc machines couldn't show up there as well because everything that's going to happen from that point forward is exactly the same as if it was an Azure VM. It's just the resource type changes from dot compute to dot hybrid compute. Um, so we're looking at how we can sort of tighten that up in the portal. Um, I, I guess the everything else it's going to treat it as hybrid or it's going to yeah it's going to treat it as being outside of azure thanks sure really all dsc extensions doing there is applying the meta the metamoth yep actually even in azure uh functionally doesn't really know the difference. Um, the guest agent service keeps track of whether it had a resource ID or not, but uh, and so it could tell the difference. But um, that's why things like virtual machine scale sets just magically worked for Azure Automation because it didn't know that it was in a scale set. It's just LCM talking to a pull service. So. Mm. Hi, uh, just a question from my side. Back in sure. your uh, first uh, first uh, slide, so first screenshot, I saw your DSC package was talking to some kind of local endpoint uh, uh, that was uh, registered, oh. like uh, to, to yep. check if that's like what kind of data does it present, and is it really documented somewhere that yep. we can? Well, if we onboard a machine to Azure Arc. Can we kind of query the its metadata yep. and kind of you are some? you are sharp. That was a really great question. <laughs> I am very impressed right now. <laughs> uh, I didn't even think about talking about that. Uh, yes, a hundred percent. So when a machine is in Azure, there's something called IMDS, Instance Metadata Service, and it is a non-routable IP that uh, any traffic from inside that virtual machine can query. And that's how from inside the machine, it's just a read only uh, rest endpoint is all it really is. Um, and from inside the machine, you can see the subscription, the resource group, the tags, and you can also get authentication tokens if the machine has an identity. Uh, so for ARC connected machines, since there's no way to set up like an off box non routable IP, it just stands up a web service um, just running on localhost uh, at the uh, port 4342. And you can see a little bit of that um, string right here. So that is documented. 
I hope. <laughs> just, I, put, I, I put the link in the chat there as well. Oh, Michael. You, that's brilliant. Thank you. Because that's on all Azure Virtual Machines, so you can use it for a number of different things as well. Yeah, and the only difference, so HIMDS may not be out here yet. Is that the link to um, IMDS or HIMDS? Yeah, IMDS. So, okay. So not the I will HIMDS. Check, and this is actually a good point. I'll check with uh, my peer Ryan, and we can probably get this out here pretty quickly. Um, the one major change that you'll find, we already have this on a, a doc that we were sharing for uh, private preview a couple of months ago. It looks like it just hasn't made the docs page yet. Uh, the the schema for the REST endpoint is very similar, except for the authentication tokens. And the major difference there is the authentication token is written to a JSON file in a location on the operating system where only administrators have access. Um, and so the idea there was uh, to just not have it be something that you can go get an authentication token for this machine, you know, just by querying a REST endpoint, at least make it someplace that's that the, the local operating system is uh, securing. And by the way, Arc fully supports Linux and Windows. Um, so for a, a Linux machine, uh, it's just someplace that I believe requires root, root privilege. Um, but yeah, that's actually exactly how the DSC resource works. It's just querying HIMDS to see what the state of the machine is. Thank you. Uh, I take it the identity is coming, right, to Azure Arc, because I don't think it's yet there. I haven't seen that option when playing around with Azure Arc. It is a <clears throat> it's a system assigned managed service identity, and because the Arc agent is using the machine's identity to talk back to Microsoft that hybrid compute, like the microservices that represent uh, the data for that RP, um, uh, the identity always gets provisioned, and it doesn't support user assigned MSI yet. Thanks a lot for that. Sure. Thank you. So the, I mean, just because you guys would probably be interested. Uh, so Nitin's team that's doing all the work for guest config has had a major role um, in all the extension management stuff for Arc. So if you get to playing around with the agent and you start looking at logs, you're very quickly going to see that what's taking the request to install an extension and then writing details about that is very, very similar to guest configuration. <laughs> um, a lot of the a lot of the logs are identical, and uh, you probably, you, I'm I'm sure if you looked hard enough, you'll see references to DSC in there somewhere because um, it's it's a very DSC like uh, implementation. Cool. Yeah, if you have any questions, I'm always in the Slack channel, so feel free to DM me or or at me anytime, and uh, I'm always happy to talk. And so, Michael, another general licensing question: What is yeah. the license for Arc itself? Yeah, uh, we are. Trying to think about the easiest way to explain this. Um, what we're thinking is that to register a machine into ARC it would not not require paying anything. Um, so it's just the projection of the machine showing up in Azure uh, wouldn't cost anything, but then consuming Azure services would. Um, so I don't think all of that has been published as far as the pricing and things like that. But in terms of the model, uh, I think we're free to share that. So we we will end up. Um, for guest configuration, Azure automation, monitoring, those all the, all the types of things that um, guest configuration didn't have a hybrid model yet. So all of the existing management services that had a charge associated with them in a hybrid model will keep getting charged. Guest configuration will get added to that list. Um, and so I'm definitely interested in feedback, uh, especially after you get a chance to use it. Um, you know what you think about that if that's the right model for you etc so as an example for instance the patch management or monitoring there would be a per vm charge for those yeah, actually patch management is free <laughs> it's free today uh yes. the update management services is a uh, free hybrid and since 
just registering ARC um, doesn't cost anything and patch management doesn't uh, cost anything, then bringing them together uh, is still going to be a free scenario. So that one's pretty cool. And now obviously you've got the inventory for free as well. Uh, inventory is considered part of Azure Automation. Um, oh. So that falls into the $6 per month. And then it has the added cost of the inventory data that gets uploaded and stored in a workspace. Uh, there's the cost for storing it in the workspace, just the data retention. Yeah, I have some smaller, more cost conscious customers who so the 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 log analytics isn't the concern. It's the per VM model, mm. which is um, slightly harder to sell to them. So yeah. even though I'm really interested in here, uh, I mean, since you brought up this point, um, if there is like a, a magic number that we could find that makes sense, you know, let, let's say it's something like a hundred machines, something like that. I don't, I don't know what the magic number is. Obviously, that's why I'm asking this question. Um, where we should just say, if in the environment's less than 50 machines or less than 75 or whatever, then we should just make that free. Um, maybe it's 10. I don't, I don't really have a good feel for this yet um, well, as to what that number would be. I think as we get more feedback from our customers, this is probably something we'll, we'll to keep a close eye on um, to where is, is there some point where we should just say, look, for small businesses, we just want to enable success. You know, who knows what that would look like, but I'm definitely interested in feedback there. It's a tricky thing to get implemented to do that that way, but I'm interested in the feedback just to better understand what battles mm -hmm. to go fight. <laughs> Yeah, or maybe it's um, something which could be considered as part of a software uh, assurance benefit yeah. or like that. I, I don't know. Yeah, so it's... Yeah, I agree. I am trying to figure that out as well. Um, yeah. Like if you have an existing system center license and things like that, I don't know if that'll ever happen, but it's definitely something I'm taking a look at. Right now, we're sort of in that phase where we're getting really close to general availability. So everybody's pretty heads down on getting the engineering work finished, but uh, we're definitely keeping a backlog of this type of feedback to figure out what we should prioritize next. Yeah. I work with several uh, small customers and I also agree that the, uh, like getting them to sell change tracking and inventory for $6 uh, per node is quite difficult and uh, I would see something like uh, DSC does that if uh, we don't really call the automation service every 15 minutes, uh, then the price goes down because I'm mm -hmm. really happy with having policy applied every week or every two weeks and mm -hmm. check for remediations. If that's a fraction of that price, then I'm I'm all in for that. Mm. Oh, that's if good that's similar to DSC. Yeah, it's something I've been thinking about. Uh, there's technically no reason why we couldn't do it that way. When you say uh, smaller customers, what scale of customer do you have in mind? Um, one to five servers. Oh, okay. Got it. <laughs> Stu, were you thinking the same? <laughs> uh, it's probably thinking close to the 100. Okay. Good to know. Uh, Michael, there's a question in the chat as well. I wasn't confusing. Uh, not the version of, oh, sorry, I'll repeat the question for the call. Uh, the question was, is the pricing dependent on the version of the DSC extension installed? And uh, I don't think there was ever a version dependency that I can recall, um, but it was dependent on the, it's, it's uh, exactly what uh, we're just referencing. Uh, it, so the you can think about it like a timer that starts and the timer um, is like the minimum billable unit was one hour so as soon as the machine contacted the service then that timer runs for one hour and uh, i think it was like fractions of a cent or something like that that adds up to six dollars per month total but if you were to as like the example that was just given you know if you turned it down to where uh, the frequency that the machine was reporting to the service instead of every 15 minutes 
if you turned it back to only once per week, then you could actually drive the cost down to well under a dollar a month. Um, so I've got a blog post out there on how to do that for DSC. And it'll still work the same way for DSC. And then uh, I think it's really good feedback that we should consider that for guest configuration as well. It's not a scenario that we've tested did yet otherwise i would say go for it um, it's just something that we haven't had a chance to investigate yet having a uh, guest config report less frequently cool cool so we should have an update to all the guest config policies go out we're actually going through the PR review today, so um, hopefully within the next few weeks where there will be a parameter on each of those policies where you explicitly have to opt in and say like it's it's uh, it's not exactly like a checkout, but it'll be like we, we want to eliminate, you know, any any chance of accidents happening where somebody assigns a policy and somebody else in the same team had created arc machines and then they get a bill and they're not sure why. So it'll be like when you assign the policy, you'll have to opt in and by default it won't include arc machines. So that's something that'll be coming in the next couple of weeks. Just to avoid any chance of an accidental bill. Um, and then actually, I was just talking to um, the automation team this past week. I think we are going to take those sample policies for onboarding both Arc machines and Azure machines um, and the DSC extension policy and uh, make those built-ins as well. So you won't have to worry about taking them from GitHub. They should just be available on the portal. That could take at least a month, but uh, we'll get there. Cool. Yeah, anything else? I'll, I'll be available on Slack anytime. Yeah, so you hey, thanks, Michael. That's really good. Thanks. So if, if there are no more questions, uh, we end this call. The next call is uh, on Wednesday, September 23rd, at the same time. So one and a half month until then. And then we have Steve Lee, as mentioned. Yeah, thank That'll you, everybody. I'll try to get yeah. Joey as well. Awesome. Yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take. Great. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everyone. I'll stop the recording now. Thank you. Goodbye.